Malay Shved is the chairman of Apparel Group. The multi-billion dollar group has over 1,500 stores and more than 75 international brands. It had a rather modest start, commencing its operation with just one brand in 1999. Nilesh revolutionized the retail industry. Setting a strong foothold in the Gulf, the apparel group has now crossed regional boundaries and embarked in the global market. Nilesh has a BSc in Business Administration from Boston University. We are genuinely privileged to be welcomed here by Nilesh Ved, the chairman of Apparel Group. And as I walked in, I saw these amazing sort of plethora of brands and stuff. And that is uh, the story of the Apparel Group and uh, Nilesh's life. And that is something we're going to be talking about today. Nilesh, it's a real pleasure to see you. It's a real privilege to be here. First of all, thank you very much, Tariq, for coming to our office and doing this with us. The difference between our company and a lot of other companies how much energy we have, how much passion we have. And that's what you can feel here. That's the only differentiator at the end of the day. And that's the reality. So how do you energize yourself every morning? What do you strive uh, to do every morning to keep yourself at your peak performance? The energy comes from a lot of people around you. Also, I spend a lot of my time in the US and Canada. Uh, when I look at what they're doing in that market and compare ourselves, we have a long way to go. Yeah. Right? When you do benchmarking yourself, with a company like Emirates Airlines, we have a long way to go. Now from here till uh, March 31st in Qatar, we're opening close to 128 stores. <laughs> that's a lot of work to be done, yeah. right? And that energizes us. Let's uh, take a little flashback to how your life started. What, who were your early inspirations and, and, how, and what shaped you at an early stage of your life? I lived in a small city I spent a lot of my time in Muscat also. I lived in a small city called Dubai. I went, ended up going to university in Boston, in Boston University, and then coming back. And when I came back in 92, I, was, I went to the family business of Gold Bullion. And uh, my dream was to go back to Boston and, or New York and start working or doing something there and doing it here because everything is small. Yeah. And then a friend of mine met me and he says, uh, what do you like to be? a big boy in a small city or a small boy in a big city. I, and that changed my mindset. I, that changed. And honestly, from 92 onwards, the way Dubai changed, uh, the leadership in, in the government department changed a lot. Mm -hmm. That helped us. Mm -hmm. We started becoming closer to understanding how they're going to change this tourism mindset. Yeah. And so I said, if we, they can change that government department, we need to change. And that really helped. So when you were at university, were you thinking of becoming an entrepreneur and, and creating something like this, or was it just something that evolved? So uh, when I was in university, it was very clear I'm going to end up in the family business. Yes, exactly. When I was in school, I was very clear I'm going to be in a business. Right? Uh, I did my undergrad in finance, international business. So I was very clear that I'm going to be in business. What I didn't know, yeah. right? but I knew that I'm going to do something big. And I have the mindset of building things, right? right? I like building. Right. So uh, I was not sure what I'm going to do. Right. There is no way I can tell you that. This business was started by my wife, Seema. Right. And I took it over. Okay. Right. So that uh, businesses are like when you spill water on the floor, right? right. It's going to find ways to get somewhere. Yeah. You, you don't know where you're going, but you have a destination. But you're going to find ways to get there. What was that turning point? What was that moment where you felt, I've got to win and I have to be number one? The idea was not to be, the, the drive was not there to be number one. Mm -hmm. The idea was, uh, was uh, I left the family business, right? And, uh, and I, I was upset when I was asked to leave. But that changed me. Because if I was to be in the family business, I would be very relaxed. There's a lot of people in the family. You don't have to do much. There was no, I mean, there's no drive to take it to a different level. But I took that as a challenge. At that moment, when you leave your family business, when you split, uh, what were the catalysts? When you, when you run a business, uh, you realize a few of the mistakes, right? So I'll give you an idea. Uh, one of the businesses I ran was Bullion. The bullion business, low margin. You have to work 24 hours. You, your holidays are Saturday, Sunday. Your holidays are Thanksgiving. Yeah. So we were, I was working on Eid and I was working on yeah. everything except 
when New York or Comex was closed. That didn't work for me. So my father told me, move to the textile business. When I moved to the textile business, I had to beg people to buy, and I had to beg people to pay me my money back. So I was given credit, so nine months credit. So that made simple rules. So you start making simple rules. Right. So number one bullion business said, low margin. So I made a rule, I'm not gonna work on low margins. Margin has to be decent enough for us to sustain. Textile business helped me said, no credit business. Right, so now if, when you do that, no low, low margin, no, I'm gonna work on decent margin, yeah. and I'm gonna work on no credit. Yeah. That left me with only one thing, retail, cash business. So you, you start making these rules for yourself, yeah. right? When you start making these simple rules, you start make, getting a path to say that's the way forward. One of the big questions always is about scaling, and uh, you started could you tell us how you started and then how you accelerated to 1,500 stores? Seema, my wife started a store in Burjuman. Uh, Bosini was a Lal's franchise and she said to her dad that I need to do something. And so he said, take this, start a store in Burjuman and see. She ran it and then I said, let me see it. When I, I'm a numbers guy, so I used to see the numbers and it's like, wow, little investment, fantastic return. And the mindset is very clear, like we want to invest little, we want the upside big, but the downside has to be small. When you're starting with small capital, they're going to invest in capital where you get 7 8% return. Because you have small capital, you need the cash to grow. Yeah. So that mindset, we said, okay, we're going to do that. It worked very well. Then we said, we're going to get, when we got nine vast. Yeah. So we got to scale it. Right? When you started scaling, right? And then when you with multi-billion dollar companies, you're always benchmarking. If they can do that in their hometown, why can't we do it in our town? Yeah. When, when an entrepreneur starts that business, he knows one few things, right? Yeah. How can I make it low cost? Yeah. How can I make good quality? Yeah. And how can I be fast? Yeah. Right? We used to get 90 days rent free from our landlords. We want to open stores in 30 days because 60 days that rent free is where we really make money. Yeah. Can we do it fast? Yeah. Do we have the speed? Yeah. Can we do it at low cost? Right? And can we have decent margin to survive? We were talking about business planning. And you said that you are an intuitive entrepreneur and you were much more focused on cash and day-to-day, -day, you know, fine-tuning on a day-to-day on -day basis. How do you scale from there? Because you, that cannot really become suddenly, you can't have a, a billion-dollar organization based around that. What was that? The, the shift also comes in from learning on the way, right? One is that. Two is that when you have partners that you're benchmarking always, yeah. they're always training you how to grow. We partner with the right people. We partner with people who have the right culture, right? And we learn. We're learning every day. So what kind of uh, rules and principles do you have in terms of relationship management? Yes. Because you have hundreds of brands and thousands of stores now. So if you have that, one is understanding the other, the partner, be it uh, an Aldo or be it a Tim Hortons or be it a Tommy Hilfiger. They all come from North America, but they all have different culture, different mindset and different views, right? We have to manage that relationship. We work with a, a, a Chinese brand, we have to manage that relationship. We work with Indian landlords, yeah. we got to manage that relationship. Today, in business, a lot of time, is relationship management sure. and relationship capital. It doesn't show on your balance sheet, yeah. Yeah. right? But it's very important that capital is, yeah. that you need to do what you need to do. Yeah. It's important for us to have that mindset saying. You go in there with a the view that I've got to structure a deal and I've got to find a way to balance, win -win. compromise, win-win. Yeah. Win-win and you've got to leave something for the other side. Yeah. Otherwise they're going to cut, you might win one deal, but yes. you're not going to do a lot more deals with them. How do you select your brands? I mean, I see a, a mix of shoes and, and, and clothes and apparel, and then you've got Tim Hortons. How do you select these? You know, usually like we just sign with Levi's now. And we've taken Levi's. For me, one thing is very important. Are we gonna be in top three of the denim market? Is this the right partner for being in that top three? We believe yes. Levi's is the king of denim. We gotta be part of it. What do we need behind it, right? We need a marketing engine, 
we need the right real estate, right people behind it. Right. And the mindset of having a turbo engine of marketing. Hey, we can market anything to you. So you're deal makers and marketeers and everything else is just... Basic operations. Operations. Right? If we, that it's people, people think that uh, it's all about capital. No. We, the biggest issue in our market that I see on entrepreneurship is they worry about capital. Yeah. I said, no, no, don't worry about that. That will come. Worry about vision. If you have vision, capital will follow you. But if you don't have a vision, capital doesn't follow you. You had all your apparel, your, your clothes, your shoes. All of, none of these brands are at their premium internationally. Uh, they are sort of mid-tier brands. Is that by design? Yes, As, because of scale. So you have a minimum rule of a brand should do business of minimum numbers. Right. And it should, is it scalable? We are one or two, we, we try, right? right? But if it's not scalable, let's not invest time and money. Yeah. See, if it's not scalable, I'll be very honest. The team doesn't like you because you yeah. can't promote them. Landlord doesn't like you because you can't pay them percentage rent. Principal doesn't like you is because your numbers are too small. Right. If you're scalable, you really get respect. <laughs> yes. it's, and you're profitable. Yeah. You only make money when you're scalable. If you're going to do 20 brands in each store, one store or two stores a brand, you're wasting your time, you're wasting everybody else's time. Levi's is a dying brand. I actually went to San Francisco uh, at the heart of where Levi's was. I, I know some people there. And, uh, and it's literally going from 7 billion to 4 billion to 3 billion. Uh, are you taking it on and reviving it for the rest of the world? Because the brand is strong, but the distribution sucks. Yeah, well, it's, if you look at emerging market, let's look at India. Levi's is number one by far. Right. What have they done right? Yeah. Right real estate, yeah. right marketing, yeah. and making sure the younger guy is coming in. Absolutely. So suddenly you took this turn into Tim Hortons. And I remember I was seeing your campaign on Sheikh Zayed's Road and stuff like that. I said, what's Nilesh up to? He's lost it. I mean, <laughs> just so much of this going on. There's Starbucks, there's this, and you killed Starbucks. Tell us that story. So. Uh, I have been, uh, before we signed, uh, five years I've been trying, running behind Tim Hortons, telling the Canadians, you got to look at this market. And then they never wanted to look at it, yeah. right? And uh, one day I get a phone call from a friend of mine. He says, Nilesh, can you help me? There's a gentleman who wants to come see the marketplace. And uh, don't ask him any questions. And don't ask me who he is. Just take care of him. He's an important guy. No problem. So he was here. And by the time he was coming a day before he called me, he says, he's chairman of Tim Hortons. Don't talk to him about business. Just show him the marketplace. So we did that. And they looked at it, there was a price. Right? Then, but still, to leave Canada and come to UAE, why UAE? Right? Why, Singapore, why not Singapore or London, right? And uh, it take, took them time. We did test runs and test runs and test runs in the marketplace before we did it. But we knew that Three, four things are important for Tim Hortons. It's fresh, it's value. It's very different than Starbucks, right? When people compare to us to Starbucks, in Canada, we don't look at Starbucks, right? We compare ourselves with other uh, QSR retailers, right? But here, the market is different. The views are different. Because my view of Tim Hortons was basically when we were doing a, a long trip in, in Canada, you basically, the truckers and normal people, normal folk, just sit there, stop and have a coffee and off they go. And, 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 and here on Sheikh Zayed Road, for example, an empty Starbucks and a full Tim Hortons. How did you do that, honestly? No, it's a customer. You know, we, that showroom was supposed to be our training center. Right. And when we put the sign up there, people came knocking on the door and says, can I have a Tim Hortons? They say, one minute, this is our training center. <laughs> we had to convert that to retail. Right. Because we were surprised. Because people would stop on Sheikh Zayed Road, on Sheikh Zayed Road, double park their car and take pictures. <laughs> and people came with emotional stories. Said, As a student, I was in Tim Hortons. You know, my mom worked there. Right. So there's so much emotion involved in it. And she said, you know what? Wow, unbelievable. Your business is a people's business, and I see a lot of young people around. How did you grow that culture and that environment to build your business with people? Our idea is always to take average people, 
right? And make them heroes, right? And the biggest thing in our business is no egos, right? Retail business is a very difficult business. Seven days a week, open 14 hours, long hours. People need to have the patience. And the problem, and not the problem, but the, the mindset of people today is that they don't want to work weekends. They want to switch off their phone at five. Honestly, I speak to my friends in the US who are retailers. Their phones are on every day. Yeah. Right? And we talk about working eight hours a day. Honestly, at Apparel, we probably need 36 hours a day. And France wants to work 36 hours a week. <laughs> That's the difference we talk about. Yeah. Right? You have to put the hard work in. Dubai City wasn't work. If you look at all the guys at the government level, at the top guys, they're in at 7.30, right? You have to put the hard work in. And people are coming in thinking, when, I, when is going to be my weekends, right? Listen, you could have a fantastic future in retail, right? And then you'll get the weekends. And that's what it is. So what do you tell them every day? And what do you do yourself every day to strive for a better tomorrow? You, you use a wonderful word that you want to take average people and make them heroes. How do you drive that? I think the retail game is all about goal setting, vision. Right? We were standing there, uh, a colleague of mine who runs sketches came to me at something. It's amazing. He brought me a card which shows he has to open a store. Every, uh, every 36 hours, you have to open one store right? till 31st March. That puts uh, alignment, right? That's alignment of the team. And then puts focus. More than anything, it put pressure, right? You don't let papers or decisions saying, let me keep pending. Everything starts moving at a line, right? That's the key for everybody to be, all the ducks to be in the same line. No one can tell me we didn't communicate this. Right. right? That's what's important. You've been a thought leader in many places, and one of them was in loyalty programs and using your mobiles at a very, very early stage to create a club apparel uh, loyalty program. Um, could you tell us about that and, and how it's impacted your business? That idea was, again, let's, let's look at this disruption, how the retail or every business is going to be disrupted, right? Let's look a little behind and say, Kodak is gone. Nokia, right? We don't know. Businesses were disrupted and they got wiped out. Yeah. Let's look at today's environment. Countries are disappearing. We saw companies disappearing. Yeah. Now today, yes. there are a few countries which have disappeared. Yes. So if you're not going to be disruptive, companies, one thing, countries are getting disrupted. Sheikh Mohammed said it, change or you will be changed. He said it, right? It was his line. Change or you'll be changed. That's the line that's in our mind. Change or you'll be changed. With that model saying, what is the loyalty program that we can use for the future? I, you can have another card. I, why would I carry another card? Are we moving backwards or are we moving for, forward? With that mindset, we said we need a loyalty program, which is going to be for the next 10 years. With that mindset of saying, how can we make this program for the future. Today we have 1.8 million members. So I can tell you, if you shop with me once, I can tell you your shoe size. Yeah. Right? I can tell you exactly where you live, how many times you go to the mall. We have so much data on that. And that's the key for our success on our loyalty program. What other disruptive things have you done in terms of disruptive innovation? You mentioned exactly Nokia and, and Polaroid and, and all of these companies going down. Um, what are your disruptive plans now? So let's look at the shoe industry, right? Brands keep coming in and out, right? So we have to keep innovative, keep bringing what's hot today and how it's going to be tomorrow, right? And at the same time, we are very careful of saying, is this the flavor of the season, flavor of the century? How long this is going to last, right? And that's what we need to always be worried about. Are we going to compete with this ourselves? And move forward. So let's look. People said, oh, you're competing with yourself. We have, you have Nine West, you have Aldo, you have Charles and Keith, you have Naturalizer, you have Tom's. Now we took Design Issue where I was DSW. Okay, so you're going to compete and kill yourself. Say, if I'm not going to do it, somebody else is going to do it. 
let me take the share and do it. So one is that thing. You compete yourself with a Chinese wall. You have a Chinese wall between each brand and you compete. That's where you get everybody fit and ready, right? One. Two, on technology front, our loyalty program is amazing. Three, we're working on a fantastic e-commerce platform, right? Price is very important in that game, but you have to be part of that game. But this is exactly where retail is going because you have your, um, your storefront, but now your home selection is just as relevant, uh, is it not? No, I mean, let's look at the other way around also. The, all my friends who are doing e-commerce in the city, they need inventory. You went to my distribution center. I have the inventory and have the rights to those inventory. I need a platform on top. It's the other way around. Right? We, we're talking about something very different. It's I have the inventory. I, I'm just putting a technology platform on top to take it forward. We're nearly there. So by January, you will see us going crazy on it. Share with us some of your failures. You keep talking about your successes, your philosophy on failure, how often have you screwed up, and what advice do you have for people? I, I think we've, we've failed several times. Right? Let's, let's, start, let's look at the starting of our business. We did a uh, little bit of Bosini. We did uh, Nine West, and Nine West was successful. At the same time, I did a bookstore, I did a jewelry store, I did a kids store. And then suddenly realized that this is draining my cash shut immediately. No egos, right? Then in 2009, during the crisis, we opened a big furniture store. Fair. Disaster. 2009, right? In Mirdiv city center. Oof. Complete problem. Shut it. The key that we learned is don't be shy of failure. Is, is there something else? There's a reason that you're failing. Because one, it makes you com comfortable of saying, I fail, I can move forward with it. Two is, every time we fail, we learn something new. Yeah. Guide you in such a way. Yeah. But failure is the essential of any success. I don't think, if there's any businessman who says, I didn't fail, yeah. tell him I said you're a liar. Or you haven't tried hard enough. Or you haven't done much. <laughs> then you haven't done much. Yes. Right? That's the rule. Yeah. Right? The other side of failure is success. And behind me is this amazing wall of fame with, uh, that you have. And um, you've won every single prize that you can think of. How do you celebrate these prizes? And how do you get your audience and your workers to share with that? You know, these, most of the time, if you see when we have to get these awards, we'll send our team to take it, right? I, I'm just a face, right? But it's really the people who are working behind the scenes the heroes behind the scenes are really doing this. And to celebrate this, uh, it helps, one, it, it's a proud moment. Two, it helps you benchmark. Are we really good? And then people start talking about it, right? Uh, a clear thing is that our business model is all about speed, right? Anytime anybody in the company who doesn't have that culture, the guy, other guy says, you know, we have this motto of speed. What, what are you doing about it, right? But the drive to achieve comes from that, right? Drive to achieve saying, how do we, it's not about the award, it's about winning. It's about goal setting. When you get these awards, you think wider, and you go deeper. You don't stop. You don't, there's no stopping on, on Emirates Airlines, or there's no stopping on Dubai Airport, or there's no stopping at Dubai Building, right? Because we built. That's what it is. It's the enjoyment of when you say, what do you feel when you come inside? We built. And that, when the metro got built in Dubai, the Burj Khalifa got built in Dubai, it's, we were part of this important day. That's, you don't get a chance in life to see Empire State Building right, when, when it was built. We saw Burj Khalifa. We are even more privileged. We actually saw it literally growing brick by brick. And there were times when they were doing a floor a week. Exactly. And, and, to, and to any kind of measure, that is just ridiculous. It can't be done. But it was. Right. So when my guy tells me that he wants to open a store in every 36 hours, possible. Possible. All you have to do is plan it. Right? So those are proud moments.
What advice do you give to young millennials, young professionals, people looking for jobs um, as they get into the, job, into the job world? What advice can you and guidance can you give them that they should apply tomorrow morning? One, you have to be curious. Two, you must have the energy. Right? Three, relationships are very important for success. Four, I would tell them, get a grey head man who you should have lunch every month, right? Who can advise you. It's important to have these guys around. If we think they're 70 years old and what are we going to learn from them? They're going to give you something that you would have never thought about. I think part of the way the world is evolving and, and technology is bringing us together, the 15-year-old and the 75-year-old are going to start connecting and I think there's a role for the 75-year-old in the future because they'll be healthier, they'll be stronger because of all the technology and, 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 and improvement of healthcare. So we need to bring them back into, uh, into our world. Nilesh, you've reached uh, an amazing inflection point. You've already grown very high and you can cruise or you can take off. What are your plans to take off or are you helping, are you just going to cruise? No, we, 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 as, as a company, as a culture, we don't cruise, we don't sleep, right? We added more companies. Let's say this year we took Levi's, we took Nautica, we took Pumpkin Patch, we took, uh, we took Juicy Couture. And now we signed DSW, which is Designer Shoe Warehouse. We added this, why? It's because it's adding that floor on the Burj Khalifa. It's an add-on business. I have the infrastructure. I have to add on. So when is it enough? It's never enough. It's never enough. I, it's, one, it's not about, people think it's all about money. No, no, no I'm not even suggesting money is, that. Yeah. Is, the financial yeah. comes, that part is done, yeah. right? It's drive of building people and seeing what they can do. So I always say, if my team, kids are going to better school, then I've done a decent job. If they have a better lifestyle, then I've done a decent job. And if they can be inspiration for their kids and everybody else, then we've really done what we need to do. How do you make a difference into, into the lives of people? It's, it's about, about community, right? How do I build a community and move forward, right? And people say, a lot of people, I mean, well, one thing that we give a lot is growth. We want you to grow, right, and fast. And we want you to not be a manager. We don't hire managers. I want you to be a businessman, a businesswoman. Tomorrow you leave me and start a business, you better be a good one. Because you were trained in that way. You fail means you've not done a job well. It's very simple. Right? You have to think 360 degrees. Managers think one angle, one line, that's my role and that's it. You have to think 360 degrees. And that's where we are successful. And that's where People, some people love us, some people can't work with us because they don't fit in the culture. So inspiration comes in is when we are pushing everybody to move to different levels. You're a great humanitarian and I, I know you do it very modestly, but uh, you've helped autism, you've looked at the environment, you've looked at various other contributions. What are the key elements that are driving you in that space and how can you make a difference within that area? Of social change? I think we have to, from my point of view, education is key, right? A lot of the countries that have issues today, more than anything, the people keep blaming the politics. I blame the education system. <laughs> if you are educated better, you will not behave like that. Right? It's that's the key for our success is my focus is how do I make sure that my people get trained better, right? So we do a lot of our guys go to HBS, right? And do the programs that we get a professor from Harvard here to help us train and guide us. For me, that's important in terms of education. Instead of just saying, with all due respect, let's build another place of worship. Let's build, we have enough. <laughs> Let's with more schools, right? That will change a lot. Let's fast forward you and take you into the future, uh, onto your 90th birthday. 
So today we are celebrating your 90th birthday. What will we be celebrating? How many more brands will we have? How many more people will we have? Or are you measuring your success and your legacy in a different way? No, I, I, when I look at that way, uh, my mind and my team always, we talk about saying, what do we want to do? A 90th birthday, as a company, what reputation do we want to have? A reputation like Tata. That's a company, right? When you see that name on a truck anywhere else, anywhere in the world, you feel good about it. It's about community, it's about how do we make a difference in a country and be part of it. What will your family be saying about you? My family is probably, is, they're always going to complain saying you spend less time at home, but that's what they will say. But they have to be, again, have that mindset of saying, how do we build it? And that's what is important to me. You build whatever you like, a construction company, uh, uh, IT company, uh, but you got to build. So a young person who's applying for a job today and have a long-term vision uh, in terms of growing their careers, would you recommend them to go into entrepreneurship and to jobs? Uh, there are two kinds of things that we're talking about. I got failure earlier in my life. You need failure for a success. Right? So you could be applying for jobs and you might fail. You could be applying for Howard HBS program and you might not get succeeded. But that gives you challenges. And those challenges are what you need to take. Right? But if you're going to be applying and then getting rejected and getting into this depression mode, right, that's something I wouldn't expect. I mean, I would recommend not do. I would say take that as a challenge and fight be a fight i mean honestly by nature yeah. that's a game it's a competition it's a drive it's a run it's a chase nilesh it's, it's been a genuine privilege and i've heard a lot about you i've seen a lot of your stuff i've uh, read about you in all sorts of places but today is the first time i've had a, a genuine meaningful authentic conversation and thank you from my heart that you've been so open and that's the inspiration the young people are looking for. So thank you very much for inviting us here. Thank you very much for, for welcoming us here in your environment. And I hope you do wonderful, great things in the future. Thank, thank you, you, sir.